Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Science Talks. My name is Martina Calcunas Rappel. I introduced myself earlier to some of you, but I just want to make sure that I introduce myself to all of you. I'm the Dean of Science. We are so glad that the Faculty of Science is a part of your lifelong learning community, and we are excited to share what our alumni, researchers, and students are doing with you tonight. Our first set of speakers are Roshan Achal and Talina Huff, and they're going to be talking about getting more from less. They're Faculty of Science alumni. They completed their master's in physics in 2015, and they're both working towards PhDs as part of Dr. Robert Walco's research team. Their work is moving into commercialization through spin-off company, the spin-off company Quantum Silicon Incorporated, or QSI, where Rashan and Talina both also work as research and development scientists. Talina has a Bachelor of Science in astrophysics, and uh, she graduated magna cum laude at the University of North Dakota. Uh, she came to the University of Alberta after an internship with NASA as a console operator for the International Space Station Agricultural Camera. When not working on nanoelectrics, Talina enjoys powerlifting and motorcycle restoration. Rashan got his Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Calgary uh, with first class honors before coming to the U of A. For Canada Day, Rashan and Dr. Walco printed a maple leaf 10,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. He's also an avid Calgary Flames, Calgary Flames fan. <laughs> <laughs> and his paper, Lithography for Robust and Editable Atom Scale Silicon Devices and Memories was one of the most read Nature Communications physics articles in 2018. So join me in welcoming them. Nice. All right, uh, thank you for those lovely introductions. Um, my name is Roshan, this is Talina. And today, we're going to be telling you about how to get more from less. But uh, this has been a pretty great event so far. Eh? Like, I really enjoyed all the appetizers. Oh, man, some of those hors d'oeuvres premium. But you know what? I'm feeling a little hungry, so I don't think I got enough. Yeah, they went really, really quick, so I'm just a little hungry. Do you think we get more food down here? Well, I mean, I got my laptop with me, so why don't we just fry up a real quick snack? Oh. So this right here is a piece of ham frying on a graphic processing unit. And this is one of the greatest problems in computation right now. And it's not just because we put deli meat on this GPU. And the problem is, is heat and what to do with that kind of heat. So um, to maybe motivate this a little bit more, I have this chart here, and I swear this is the most sciencey chart you'll see tonight. But it highlights a very, very important fact about uh, computational processing. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is basically that your computation should increase exponentially as the years go on. And so you'll see that we did follow that trend for quite a while here, um, this being like the linear curve here. And then sometime in the mid-2000s, instead of continuing onto that curve, um, the speed that our processors run at has kind of plateaued. And that's kind of a problem, like it's holding your computers up and maybe those cat-like pictures aren't coming up as fast as you want them to. And the reason for this is what we showed you on the previous slide, which is heat. And so we hit the heat dissipated in a stove per equivalent unit area in a processor sometime in the mid-90s. And right now we're sitting at just slightly below nuclear reactor heat dissipation, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. And so you might have also noticed that in your processors, we've been stuck at I7 for a while now. In fact, we're on the ninth generation of I7. And despite that, we've been stuck at a couple gigahertz for a long time. And the reason for that is because if we kept making them faster, eventually we'd be at rocket nozzle, which we kind of want to avoid. So uh, what can we do about that? So tonight in our presentation, what we're going to do is we're going to tell you a little bit about uh, some ways that we are going to reduce the power consumption in your devices. And while reducing the power consumption, we're also going to increase the speed at which you can do these kinds of computations. And finally, um, we're going to store as much data per unit area as possible in the smallest physical footprint. So what are a couple of challenges that we're facing here? All right, so two of the biggest challenges when people are trying to build structures with atoms 
is that instead of taking something big and working it its way down to something small, like they do in our current way of making computer chips, you start with individual atoms and you try and place them. The problem is, to get them to generally stay where you want, you have to work at extremely cold temperatures. So absolute zero, ooh, that is not my laser. Absolute zero here, which uh, we might call a typical Edmonton winter. Uh, but you know, Edmonton aside, uh, it's not really practical. You know, it might get a little warmer, like minus 35 here in Edmonton. And even at that temperature, those atomic scale structures that they've made would just disappear. They'd vanish, uh, become totally useless. Uh, the other problem at these atomic scale approaches is that they often use exotic materials that, say, an Intel or a Samsung aren't used to working with. Uh, so they use copper or chlorine or these other foreign materials that you might not want on your phone or just aren't very practical for integrating into our current fabrication processes. So our small solution to this problem is that we use silicon and hydrogen. These are two very common materials that are actually in your phone right now or your computer, and Intel and Samsung are very familiar with these. So by starting with these uh, building blocks that the semiconductor industry is already using, it already makes adoption much easier. Uh, and then the structures we're building atom by atom here, so we're moving hydrogen atoms around on a silicon surface, uh, are actually very stable. In fact, you can heat them up to 200 degrees Celsius. So in case you accidentally set your computer on fire, your device that should theoretically still be OK. But you might be wondering, so how do we make these fantastical devices? And so that's where our main tool comes in. And so this is called a scanning tunneling microscope. And despite looking like some crazy like outer space satellite probe thingy, um, at this fundamental level, it's actually quite simple. And so this is basically just a fancy machine that consists of a very sharp needle at one point. And so fun fact, we actually have the Guinness World Record for sharpest man-made object. And so what we do is we come in with our super sharp tips and we manipulate the atoms one by one. So it's kind of hard to picture what's going on inside of that big, shiny, spaceship-looking thing. So we have a little bit of a visualization here. We have our silicon atoms in green. We have our hydrogen atoms bonded to the surface in white. We bring that very sharp tip in over one of the hydrogen atoms we want to remove. We apply a little bit of electricity, rip that atom right out of there, and we're left with this really useful vacancy. You might be wondering, how good are we at removing atoms from this surface? Well, in fact, the University of Alberta is actually the best in the world at doing this. Just for a fun comparison, uh, you know, our competitors out east in Waterloo, they decided for Canada's 150th birthday to make the world's smallest flag. Well, not to rub it in the face too much, but we also did something for Canada's 150th birthday here. And exactly to scale, if you look, there's this tiny little rectangle here. And if you zoom in, there's our beautiful structure here. <laughs> so this uh, maple leaf, as the dean mentioned, is uh, about 10 nanometers in diameter, which is about 10,000 times smaller than your hair and it just consists of removing 32 hydrogen atoms from the surface. I always said we were better than Waterloo. Yeah, but we wouldn't want to tell them too much. <laughs> so um, it would be a little bit disingenuous to pretend that we made that perfectly all in one go. Uh, the thing is, removing hydrogen atoms from the surface of silicon has been known for a long time. In fact, probably about before Talina and I were even born. Uh, the thing is, that's been holding this whole fabrication process back, is that when you remove an atom from the surface, there was no way to uh, put it back. So if you made an error, if you removed an atom by accident, that whole structure was useless. So if I was trying to make that uh, flag and there was one atom out of place, I'd probably cry because it was late at night and I was stuck in the lab, but I'd have to start over. However, a couple years ago, we actually figured out a way to take a hydrogen atom that becomes stuck to the tip and coax its way back onto the surface. And all of a sudden, it opened up this amazing error correction ability. So as you can see, I actually did screw up while making this maple leaf. There's an error here and here. But taking a hydrogen atom on the tip, we're able to plunk it back on the surface, do a little bit of atomic scale surgery, get rid of that other mistake, remove the correct atom, and we're left with this beautiful structure here. Now, this is just a really nice demonstration of fabrication. This leaf, aside from looking beautiful, doesn't do very much. So Talina will describe a little bit about how this is actually useful for electronic devices. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna tell you about how we can get more from less. And so we actually use these dots for replacing uh, pieces of your computer. And so the way that I always like to explain it to people is think about if you have two buckets and you have this like nifty little tube that connects the two buckets. Now imagine you pour water in one of these buckets. It doesn't matter which one. Um, you're gonna have that water go half into one and half into the other. And so this is analogous to our little pattern atomic structures, except instead of water, we have an electron that's in here. So now imagine you have your buckets, they're half filled with water, and let's just say that you lift bucket number two up. 
water's gonna all go to bucket number one because gravity is gonna force it that way. And so that's kind of what we're doing here. We have this negative charge, which we call just a perturbing asymmetry. And what it does is it forces the electron that's shared among these two pattern atoms to kind of go to the left. And so what we do is we say, well, if it's in the left, we'll call it a binary one. If it's in the right, we'll call it a binary zero. And in that way, we can encode binary information into where this electron likes to sit in these like paired dot structures. And so what happens if you take two of these like bucket, uh, buckets that are connected and you put them close to each other? Well, we all know like charges repel, and so you're gonna have that electron localized to the outside. And then let's just say we go back and we put another one of these asymmetries over here. Um, the electron in this one is going to cause this bucket to tip, and that bucket's gonna cause that bucket to tip, and the effect kind of cascades down a bit like dominoes falling. So let's take this a step further. So here's some of the longer binary wires that we've made. And so once again, it's just like the last slide that we showed, um, where if you have an asymmetry, you can cause the buckets to kind of tip all the way down and communicate your binary information back and forth. And so the thing that I'd really like to highlight to you that's really, really important about this is that we're using incredibly little power. So like a traditional wire or a traditional transistor like you would have in your chips in your phone uses millions and millions of electrons. And these millions of electrons are jostling around and hitting each other and that's actually what causes the heat problem that we told you about earlier. So here we're not pushing millions of electrons that are interacting with each other around. We're simply telling a single electron in these pattern circuits where we would like it to sit. And so it's incredibly low power, there's no heat generated, and we think that the way that they you know, slosh to one side is super fast. So instead of the couple gigahertz that we're stuck at right now, uh, we think these could go to hundreds of gigahertz, drastically improving the speed of your machines. And of course, they're the ultimate in small. We're literally moving around individual atoms. You really can't get a lot smaller than that. And more importantly, they can also be used for time travel. Okay, they can't be used for time travel, I'm totally joking. Uh, we like to call this little structure here our flux capacitor because it looks a little bit like the flux capacitor from Back to the Future, but this is not for time travel. It's actually the world's smallest logical OR gate. And so um, millions of these are in your phone right now and they kind of just make decisions about where the binary information goes. Um, but this is the most power efficient and smallest one ever created. And so if you'll bear with me, what you'll see is that the binary states of our little highlighted boxes here will change and we can change them with inputs just like in the last one. So we can just go through that and we can toggle through all the binary states. And we call this dynamic atomic logic. Dynamic just being that we're telling an electron where we would like it to go and that's representing our binary information. And so by printing with atoms, we can recreate all the functionality that you would have in a traditional computer chip, but faster, smaller, and more efficient. So um, like I said, this is dynamic, but we can also do very, very interesting things with static assemblies of these. All right, so Talina was talking about looking at the positions of electrons within these atomic structures that we're making. Um, there are different things you can do with the actual position of these atoms themselves. So I told you we're really good at removing atoms from the surface, and now we can put them back. And that led us very naturally to the idea of something's there, something's not. It's very familiar to a zero or one that a computer might think about. So here we see the letter A and the binary representation of how your computer would store it. We can actually translate that into how we position atoms. So above is where we've removed two hydrogen atoms to represent the letter A. Because we can put atoms back and remove them at will now, we can rewritably go through the whole alphabet here. So A, B, C, D. Um, because these are using these vacancies that I showed you earlier, they, this memory inherits that amazing thermal property. So unlike all of the other demonstrations of atomic scale memories, this is actually stable above room temperature or even up to that 200 degrees Celsius. The other amazing thing about this is because we're using these individual atoms, the memory is incredibly dense. And what that means is on a postage stamp, for those of you familiar with snail mail still, uh, you can store 138 terabytes. That's more memory than I think most of us have ever had, ever really. Uh, and for a more modern example, you could actually store all 42 million songs of the iTunes library on the face of a quarter and still have room for more. Um, this is really, really useful for potential archival applications. Uh, so say you need to archive all of Wikipedia, all of everything. As we generate more and more data, we're going to need more and more places to store it. And so we're building these large data centers, and it would be amazing, really, if we could store a thousand times as much data in the same area. That would uh, prevent us from needing to make more data centers sooner, and say your 4K video would be just as safe. Uh, one issue with this right now is that it's quite slow, so we're really working to improve that, but that's why archival is really the main uh, push to start with, because when you're archiving something, it doesn't really need to be fast. Uh, so for fun, 
we also decided to store the first 24 notes of the Super Mario theme song in Atoms. So you can see that here. And just you wait, it gets better. We can actually play this back like a record player. So by scanning that sharp tip over this structure, we can actually play back music from Atoms. So if you give a listen, oh, it's not going to play. <gasps> no. It's OK. I swear it's worth it. You guys need to see this. It's super cool. Oh, no. Help. <laughs> Give me one second. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so, you know, it sounds pretty close. <laughs> we didn't put any timing, and we tried to keep it simple. <laughs> so this is pretty much the best thing I think I've done so far in grad school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, so you might be wondering, uh, what's next? So obviously we've shown you some very simple examples today, but we really need to focus on taking it to the next level. And so our short-term goals are to build larger structures that have more functionality so that we can get to that step of replacing your processors. And so um, another thing um, I think Roshan mentioned it earlier is increasing the writing speed for the atomic memory. So right now it's like semi-automated and we kind of have like an AI robot that goes around and makes them. But to make it a real true like technology that's gonna have mass adoption, we need to speed that up significantly. And so a short-term thing that we're thinking about is just integrating our devices with conventional technologies that already exist. So say your laptop has one particularly hungry like chip that like takes a ton of power. Uh, maybe we could short-term like pattern atoms that would make that more efficient and just directly integrate it into what already exists. And so our goal is to hopefully go uh, in the 10th generation of i7 processor from that limit of 2.67 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. And so um, with that, yeah, we'd like to thank all of our partners that helped make this research possible. And of course, we'd like to thank all of you guys for attending, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. So we have uh, time for questions. If anyone has questions, please feel free um, to put up your hand, and Don will bring a microphone to you. I think there's a question in the back, Don. I would assume then that if you can make it cooler and smaller, that we can create greener uh, server centers around the world. I, I'm assuming this? Yes. How far away do you think you are? Because as you know, global warming is. Uh, that, that's a really upon good question. Us, yes. Um, so, yes, the idea behind lower power computation would be that. Uh, in essence, it would be very much greener, so you could do the same computation with less power. Uh, and so that's one of the big goals. Uh, in terms of how far away uh, we're pushing, we have the resources of these lovely groups here, um, especially Quantum Silicon is the spin-off company of, my, or of our supervisor that we work with. And uh, really, to make the push, it all comes down to investment. So you know, if an angelic billionaire came down from the skies and we had infinite resources and infinite people, it could be very soon. Uh, you know, if it's us plugging away at a university for about a decade, it could be on that time scale as well. So have you approached the big data hungry, like Facebook and Google, that are some of the biggest power suckers on the planet? Well, we're hoping that by doing events like this, we can get a little bit more exposure for our work and hopefully get the attention of those kinds of people that would want to invest in us more. And so we're working on it, but it's always good to have like the attention of like, you know, really well connected people to hopefully get us there. Approaching them directly. Uh, so I think we want to be a little more mature before we, we take that leap. So we, we've had some really great proof of concept demonstrations. But to really scale and prove a scalable technology, we still have a few steps to take. Thank you. OK. Connie, question? Yeah. Uh, so if you take a look at, say, someone like Intel, when they, when they um, write one of those big wafers uh, with all the chips. Yeah. With your technology, would you be trying to achieve the same, uh, same size of chip being more powerful, or would you be trying to scale that chip down uh, to achieve a, a modest increase in performance? 
Uh, I think it could realistically be either. So I mean, if there was like a specific application, let's say you're on the International Space Station and you need like to have like the lightest things possible, we could approach somebody like that and be like, hey, we have a solution for that. We can make your like, you know, chips and electronics a fraction lighter and that will reduce your cost to actually send it up there, right? Um, or we could just make what you currently have more powerful. Like honestly, we're pretty much open to whoever wants to like, you know, help us like get there. Other questions? How susceptible are these technologies to quantum tunneling effects? That's a great question, too. Uh, so the electronics Talina showed actually rely on the tunneling phenomena. So you have an electron in that uh, left bucket or right bucket, and the only way it can traverse those two is uh, via quantum tunneling. So I guess to answer your question, it, they are susceptible to quantum tunneling, but that is a feature. <laughs> OK, we have time for one more question. There was a presentation recently in the last couple of weeks on data storage in DNA. And how does this fit in terms of the, uh, the scale of uh, data compression? Is it similar to what's going on? Are you familiar? Um, I've looked into this a little bit, actually, because I feel like this is going to be a question that comes up when people ask me about this when I'm defending my thesis. Uh, so it's, it's hard to exactly compare DNA to a 2D surface one-to-one, uh, -one because DNA is generally given in sort of data per volume, so a three-dimensional thing, whereas this is on a flat 2D surface. And so I haven't actually seen two metrics that you can compare one-to-one -one there. However, um, atoms, individual atoms are already much smaller than DNA, because DNA consists of many atoms. Uh, so the three-dimensional volume might give it some edge in some sense, but I think in terms of just raw density, this is currently winning. Great. Join me in thanking Rashan and Talina for a great talk. Thank you. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Jonathan Banks, and he's going to talk about the energy beneath our feet. Jonathan is a research associate in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. He's part of the University of Alberta Future Energy Systems Program. Jonathan received his bachelor's and master's in geology from the University of Florida, and he came to the University of Alberta as a postdoctoral fellow in 2013. His research has led to the development of a supercritical co 2 fuel geothermal power system that's being integrated into existing oil and gas infrastructure. He's a project lead on hybrid geothermal power plant pilot project in Swan Hills, and we're delighted to have him here to speak to us. Oh, the computer is locked up, I'm being told. I've had some tough acts to follow, but I've never had anybody steal my Back to the Future jokes before, so <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. I guess Luke. Pause, pause for a moment for station identification. Okay, we're back. Hi, I'm Jonathan, and I'm here to talk to you about geothermal energy research here at the University of Alberta. It's a hot topic. So, can't, I'm, con I'm contractually obliged to say that at the start of any presentation. Yeah, so I'm here to talk to you about geothermal energy. Geothermal energy, in short, refers to the heat that's stored within the interior of the Earth. The Earth is very hot. I have some statistics here. 99% uh, of the Earth, for example, is uh, over 1,000 degrees Celsius, and the outer core of the Earth is actually hotter than the surface of the sun. Uh, we as humans cannot access so much of this very hot volume. What we can access is really the upper 5 to 10 kilometers of the Earth's surface. And within that depth, we talk about a geothermal gradient, which is the rate at which heat increases as you go deeper. And as you go deeper, the temperature increases, the continental average. So if you just throw a dart at a map and hit a land mass, the average continental gradient, geothermal gradient in that area will be about 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So to reach 
a depth at which water would boil, you'd have to drill about three or three and a half kilometers. There's some variability in here if you just go to the southwest of Edmonton, out by Devon, and then down to Red Deer. It gets a little hotter. In some places, it's 50 or 60 degrees per kilometer. If you go out to the eastern part of the province or the far south, there are some places where it's only 15 or 20 degrees per kilometer. And that's highly variable based on local geology. Boom. Uh-oh. Oh, here we go. Uh, so what is, how do we produce geothermal energy? Bas the basic principle is that you have two wells. In this scenario, there are a few more than one wells, and you have a production well which produces hot fluid from the subsurface. There's some sort of industrial infrastructure here at the surface that makes use of the heat either directly to provide heat for something or converts that heat to electricity using various types of turbines, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this is what's called the conventional geothermal system where you have a point source of heat uh, you have recharge, active groundwater recharge through rain or what have you, a leaking river. And this point source of heat constantly heats the recharge fluid. So you get a little bit of a convection current. Raise your hand if you know what a convection current is. So these are alumni of the Faculty of Science. Very good. Um, so this is a conventional geothermal system. Uh, what's being explored uh, more recently over the last 15 years, really starting to pick up, pardon the pun again here, steam in the last five years, that one just popped in my mind, uh, are these engineered geothermal systems where you might have a reservoir that just is taking uh, advantage of the background radiant and conductive heat of the Earth, and we can engineer a fracture network here, inject water from the surface, let it heat up, reproduce it, basically operating on the same principle. This one, uh, this conventional geothermal system is typically taking advantage of natural fractures in the subsurface, so you're looking for a tectonically active or a volcanically active area. This type of technology we're hoping to be able to apply anywhere. Um, an average geothermal well can produce anywhere from 20 to 100 megawatts of thermal power, which under nor with normal conversion technology equates to 2 to 10 megawatts of electricity. How much electricity does it require to run a flux capacitor? Gigawatts, so orders of magnitude. 1.21 gigawatts. I think I actually took the, uh, the Back to the Future slide out of here. I had a premonition. Um, so what do we do with this heat? At the low end, uh, this is the kind of stuff your aunt or your uncle or your niece or your nephew has installed on their house. I meet a lot of people, oh, you do geothermal? My uncle's got geothermal on his house. Not really. Sorry, what he has is he's using the, or she, your aunt maybe, is using the very upper ground surface to store solar heat. And this is called the geo exchange system. This is something that is commercially available around the world and is actually quite common here in Canada as well. As you move up the scale, you start to have more industrial uses for heat. This here is an alligator farm. I'm from Florida, as you mentioned. We have a lot of alligators there. We don't have snow-covered mountains. This is in Colorado. They're using geothermal heat to heat this alligator farm. They're raising alligators for meat and clothing, nice boots and whatnot. Uh, other uses of heat, this is an ornamental flower greenhouse in the Netherlands. Um, and so agricultural uses, aquaculture uses, this is all uh, within the range of the 50 to 100 degrees within the geothermal world. As soon as you start getting up above 100 degrees, certainly above 120 degrees, we can start talking about producing electricity, first using a binary cycle engine. I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then as you get up over 200 degrees Celsius, you can have these flash steam plants. This is the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. Anybody been to the Blue Lagoon in Iceland? A few. This is a geothermal accident. They had a geothermal well here. It sprung a leak. It flooded a low-lying area. Now people pay good money to go bathe in the geothermal leak. In fact, the Blue Lagoon makes more money than the geothermal power plant <laughs> here in the background. You're laughing, but I'm not joking. All right, moving on. This is how a binary cycle engine works. I'll just roll through this real quickly. Basically, in a low enthalpy or low temperature type geothermal environment, which is ubiquitous here in Canada, uh, we can't just boil water and run a steam turbine like you would in a coal plant or a nuclear plant or uh, what have you. What we do is we produce the hot geothermal fluid, and this boils a fluid with a lower boiling point than water, usually an organic solvent, an R132, an alcohol something of that sort, and then that vapor phase is what drives your turbine. It's recondensed. It's called the binary cycle engine because the primary geothermal fluid is not what's directly driving the turbine. Uh, these are direct use statistics, so you can see this ground source heat pumps is far and away 
the most common use of uh, geothermal energy, direct use of geothermal energy in the world. Second is the greenhouse and agricultural uses. As far as geothermal electricity is concerned, uh, the latest really um, reliable global statistics were from the World Geothermal Congress in 2015. The World Geothermal Congress is something that happens once every five years, so all of these statistics are expected to be updated this coming uh, spring, and we have actually a large delegation here from the University of Alberta with papers submitted that will be presenting at this conference in Iceland. Currently, there's about um, 13 gigawatts, so that's 10 Back to the Future time machines worth of geothermal power installed around the world, and it's projected to increase up to about 20 gigawatts over the next five years. So we'll see if we hit that target here in a few months. Uh, back to the convection cell. So the Earth basically is a gigantic convection cell. The heat from the core of the Earth actually boils the Earth's mantle in a very slow rolling boil. So if you want to make pasta, you boil water, you bring it to a rolling boil, you throw your pasta in. The Earth's mantle is basically a gigantic, slow-moving, rolling boil, where partially molten rock formed here at the outer core becomes buoyant and comes all the way back up to the Earth's surface, where it loses its heat and drops back down its subduction zones, and it creates this rolling boil of semi-liquid rock. At the Earth's surface, this looks like there are areas where there are clearly hot places on the Earth's surface. This is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is where all that heat is rolling up to the top of your boil, and then here where you have the blue, these are subduction zones. I've labeled a few of them. Uh, here's a good one. This is the ring of fire here. And you can see it's cold because this is where it's all given off its heat. What we also see from this map is that the areas where we can develop really high temperature geothermal systems are quite limited, and many of them are under 8,000 meters of water. So that's a challenge in the geothermal energy research community. And one of the ways that we've addressed this challenge recently, especially over the last 10 years, is we've started to look at continental basins. Uh, basins can be very deep, so if you remember this geothermal gradient that I presented to you in the beginning, many of these basins are 10, 15 kilometers deep, so certainly we can drill down to where there's hot enough fluid to produce electricity. And we can see here on this map, Western Canada has the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin, which is a world-class hydrocarbon producing sedimentary basin, so we have a continental scale laboratory for exploring modern geothermal technology right here under our feet in Edmonton. Uh, so a little bit about that program. Um, our geothermal research program right now is funded through the university's Future Energy Systems Program, also with large scale support from Alberta Innovates, I should mention, although they're not up here on the slide, their CCITF program. The goal of future energy systems research in geothermal energy is to produce scientific, engineering, economic, environmental, and social scientific research in support of three specific types of geothermal energy use available to Canadians. Uh, their direct use of geothermal energy is heat. I don't know if you've lived through a Canadian winter, but it gets kind of cold here. Uh, the city of Edmonton spends millions, if not tens of millions of dollars, for example, doing something as trivial as keeping snow off the road when there is 90 degree water underlying the entire city and wells to access that water as well. Uh, the next area is electricity production from the deep basin using low and ultra low temperature differential heat engines. So this is advancing not only the forefront of geothermal energy research, but also of waste heat recovery. And we're doing this in partnership with the Faculty of Engineering. And then finally, uh, enhanced geothermal energy recovery from hydrothermal systems and crystalline rocks. Um, just a couple numbers in our research program. We currently have four projects funded through the university. This includes 10 co-PIs. I'm actually the only co-PI that's not on the faculty. I don't know how that happened. Actually, I do know how that happened, but that's a story for another day. Uh, currently, we have 26 AQ HQP. Those are bachelor students, master students, PhD students, and postdocs enrolled in our program. And we have about $1.5 million in federal and provincial and private sector leverage funding through the end of this fiscal year. Uh, just a brief rundown of the four projects that we have before I turn it over for questions. Project one is focused on what we call the Cordillera. This is the mountainous regions of uh, eastern BC and western Alberta, where we're exploring intermontane regions. So we see that the topographic relief in many of these um, mountainous regions is so great that it creates a geothermal gradient of its own coming down into the valleys. And so we're doing a lot of non-invasive geophysics to try to explore where there might be hot spots in these intermontane regions. 
Uh, the second project, which is really our flagship project as far as I'm concerned, focuses on geothermal resources of the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin. The Canadian federal government has invested over $75 million in commercial geothermal energy development in the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin in the last year. A lot of this is arising directly out of work that we've done here at the University of Alberta. So although we're only involved in one or two of these projects, I'm very proud of the fact that many projects are starting to take off here in the basin. And here we do a lot of traditional reservoir modeling. This is something you'd see in an oil and gas context. Uh, this here is a model of using an individual well bore as a downhole heat exchanger. So of course, the $10 billion question here in Alberta is what to do with all of our legacy oil and gas assets. Um, and this is one thing that we can do. We can use these all as heat exchangers. Uh, for example, this reservoir model right here, there are $15 million of uh, research and development and exploration costs embedded in this model that because there are so many wells drilled into our basin, we're able to do research like this for tens of thousands of dollars rather than tens of millions. Uh, so there's already an economic value in all of these wells. We have some thermal modeling. We've done some regional studies so on and so forth. Our third project is focused specifically on using low temperature heat for electricity generation. And the main thing we're developing here is a Stirling engine. This is a 200-year-old thermodynamic cycle that does not involve the phase change of a fluid to create mechanical energy. And so by, not, by avoiding that phase change that you'd see in the Rankine cycle engine I showed you earlier, uh, we're able to access a lower temperature range. Um, and so that's the focus on this engine. Right now we have an engine that can produce maybe 15 watts of power, not enough to run your flux capacitor. We're working on scale, enough to run your LEDs. Uh, we're working on scaling that up to a kilowatt size engine, enough to run your dryer. And so uh, what else do we have? Our final project is focused uh, not so much on scientific stuff, or not so much STEM field science, I should say, but on socioeconomic roadblocks and roadmaps to creating geothermal energy. In this project, we do a lot of networking with the Alberta government, helping them define what a geothermal resource is. We do a lot of work with private companies, helping them develop economic forecasts uh, to see if a proposed project they have is going to be economic vi economically viable. And we also do a lot of work with indigenous communities, both here in Alberta as well as up in the Yukon, to make sure commercial legal obligations to free prior and informed consent are met and to make sure the voices of the indigenous people on whose land we want to develop these projects are heard and recognized. Uh, sorry if I went a little bit over. That's all I got for you now. Time for questions? Thanks, Jonathan. We have time for questions. Um, what yes, kind of geothermal system have they put into Blatchford Field, and what's your opinion of the technology they're using? Uh, I know years ago, when I first moved here, which was in 2013, there was some discussion around a ground source heat pump system for Blatchford, uh, which was not accepted, and then recently, with the ongoing development, a new system was designed, which I haven't seen the details of, so I will not comment on what I think about it, but I Pretty sure it's also a ground source heat pump system. Question in the front. Better than nothing is what I, I'll, I guess I'll say to that regard. Yeah. Nice answer. Question in the front. What Hi. would you say is the biggest barrier towards large scale incorporation of geothermal into the Alberta energy landscape? There are a couple of big issues. Uh, the, the first one is the nature of the resource itself. So even in the best scenario out by Hinton and Grand Cache and maybe even as far south as Rocky Mountain House and Caroline, we can't really access temperatures that are all that hot. The hottest we find throughout the basin is maybe 150, 160 degrees reliably. And these are all in gas reservoirs, which means there's not a lot of water in there. Or if there is water in there, it's not very mobile. Um, so there are some technical challenges to the resources. We don't really see any one particular field being able to generate 100 megawatts like you'd see in Iceland or uh, in California. They have a geothermal field that's producing close to a gigawatt of power. So we will never have that here. Uh, but the advantage is we don't have very high population demand. So, you know, we could easily run the entire town of Tinton off of a geothermal plant. So there are some resource aspects to it. Some of it is related to population density. We have a lot of heat that's available to us, but we don't quite know what to do with it. Um, and so there's some ingenuity issues there. And then third, I think there's a little bit of a political challenge in that the Alberta government has, until now, and this is not a comment on one political party or another, because neither of them have succeeded in doing this, but... 
Uh, the resource is not legally defined here in Alberta, and so that scares away a lot of private investment, I think. It's difficult to get a bank to finance something that's not explicitly legal. <laughs> or Next. so I've heard. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Next question there. How much energy can you get out of the tail end of the process? There was a slide there that had an evaporative cooling step on the separate working fluid. You also spoke of low and ultra-low differentials. So how much can you get out of the end of the system and put the coolest uh, fluid back down to pick up more heat and get the most out of each pull of fluid up? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the major competitive advantages that the province of Alberta has in this type of low temperature geothermal energy production compared to global markets is that we have extremely cold winters, which improves the performance of the thermodynam any thermodynamic cycle quite dramatically. There is an optimal reinjection temperature. So a lot of the places where we're producing geothermal energy, I mean, right now in Alberta, there are gigawatts, tens of gigawatts, if not hundreds of gigawatts of thermal energy being brought to the surface by oil and gas production throughout the province. The question becomes how much of that can reliably use for geothermal. We don't want to cool that down too much because if you inject really cold water back into the oil and gas reservoir, you'll deteriorate the quality of the oil and gas production. So there's a balance there between maximum amount of cooling and maintaining the oil and gas production. And that's one of the reasons why we have this partnership right now with Razor Energy is to explore issues like that um, so then we can extrapolate those results across the whole province. Other questions, Don? Uh, I have one here. Okay. I've toured the thermal generation plants in Southern California, and one of the issues they have is that the, the water that is brought up, the hot water, is full of incredibly damaging minerals, and they spend a great deal of money on maintenance uh, as a result of the destructive properties of, of what they're bringing up. Yeah. And I'm curious if the difference in climate and um, geology in Alberta makes any difference to that process. Also a great question, also a great segue into our next topic. Um, and that's an issue, that's the topic I actually wrote my PhD on, uh, scaling risks in geothermal power plants. And it's highly localized. Uh, it depends on the nature of the brines you're producing. The brines in the Alberta Basin here are surprisingly actually not that saline compared to some brines we see in Germany or brines in Southern California. Scaling, uh, what you're talking about, mineral precipitation in an industrial infrastructure is a concern, but it's a known unknown. So it's something that we know about, we know is gonna be a problem and can incorporate into the planning of a power plant ahead of time. The research that we've done here shows that the two main scale forming minerals we expect to find in our geothermal systems here are quartz and calcite, silicon dioxide, and calcium carbonate. And both of these are, are known and easily, I don't want to say easily, but manageable scaling risks. So it's something that we need to be aware of from the beginning, and then we can design our systems to handle this type of scaling. But it's certainly not as aggressive a scaling product as you would find in some of these systems you're talking about in Southern California. That's good. Yeah, on that note, I think we're going to pass it over to the next speaker who will talk more about that very issue. I don't want to steal your thunder. Yep, we're, we're great. Thank you, Jonathan. Join me in thanking Jonathan for his talk. Our next and final speaker is Chris Dernbos, and he'll speak on the evolution of energy. Chris is the president and CEO of E3 Metals. He received his bachelor's degree in geology from the University of Alberta in 2005. His career has taken him from copper and gold exploration in the Yukon, northern BC, and Australia to oil and gas work with industry in Alberta, and then back to Australia, subsequently to Sweden, for another stint in mineral exploration. In Australia, Chris embraced his entrepreneurial leanings and co-founded a company called MindQuest. He then began his entrepreneurial quest for lithium, which brought him back to his home province of Alberta and saw the birth of E3 Metals. E3 Metals is targeting the development of petrolithium, a new source of lithium from reservoirs associated with oil and gas production within the prolific Leduc Formation in Alberta. His team is currently working with Dan Alessi, an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, on a collaborative research development project to determine how best to extract and purify the lithium. 
He is also an aviator and toyed with flying from Calgary to join us tonight on his own plane. Please join me in welcoming Chris. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is the first time I've sat down on this side of a lecture hall at the U of A, so I'm a bit nervous, but um, thank you. I think the presentations today, you guys, uh, what you're doing is very cool. I've seen Jonathan Banks, there's a lot of similarities to what we're doing. Um, I'm here to talk to you about lithium. I really wanted to have a bit more fun with this talk because I spend a lot of time talking to investors and that sort of thing about, you know, why would you want to invest in E3? And I really want to talk more about the technology because this is a bit of a unique Alberta situation and solution. So we are a public company, so I have to do the forward-looking statement disclaimer, but we're also going to make some backward-looking statements. I also have some gratuitous use of smart art, so I apologize for that. Um, some acronyms, ICE stands for your current car, uh, EV stands for your next car. Uh, <laughs> took me a bit to figure that one out. Um, all right, so in, uh, when new technologies come on the scene, um, they're often uh, instantaneously disruptive but generally they don't often uh, disrupt instantaneously. And you know, geothermal is a good example of that. Um, the example I'm using tonight is uh, the vehicle, and specifically the electric vehicle. So I don't know if you know, but the first electric vehicle uh, was invented in uh, like 1865, shortly after the lead acid battery was invented around 1850. So the electric vehicle has been around as long as the internal combustion engine. In fact, until about the 1920s, Electric vehicle was the most more popular uh, mode of transport. And the reason was that we only had to go small distances. And we didn't need big range. The cars were pretty rudimentary. You can look at, think of any first Ford vehicle, um, you know, that sort of, that sort of uh, scenario. So it wasn't really until the 1920s you know, that, um, you know, vast petroleum reservoirs were found. Gasoline got very cheap, internal combustion engines became the more uh, predominant uh, mode of transportation, simply because they had advantages. They had range. And that range with a lead-acid battery, you're just, you just never could get. Um, and so uh, gas station infrastructure became more prominent than charging station infrastructure, and eventually the electric vehicle uh, disappeared. And when you think of a gas tank, it, it is a combustible source, but it also uh, is a mobile source of uh, energy which is really just a battery. So you're, you can think of your gas tank as a battery for your car. So no different. Um, fast forward 100 years, and the uh, resurgence of the electric vehicle shows up. Uh, and there were other vehicles before this, but really the one that we all remember probably is the uh, EV1 from GM around 1996. Same technology from 1850, a lead-acid battery. It had a range of about 100 kilometers. Went to, um, weighed about 550 kilograms, this battery. Um, and you can think of battery technology, uh, one analogy is, is weight to power ratio. So the lead acid battery, 500 kilograms, about uh, enough power to go about 100 kilometers. Um, the nickel metal hydride, the next sort of main uh, technology, it was the, generation, the third generation of the EV1 uh, in early 2000. Um, there's my smart art. Um, it, uh, and transition, uh, thank you very much. It, uh, <laughs> the, it, it, it was about the same weight, 500 or so kilograms, um, gave, the, gave the car range about 200, 220 kilometers. Um, what happened after that, uh, if you've ever looked or seen the documentary, uh, Who Killed the Electric Car, there's also some conspiracy theories, but it sort of went quiet for about 10 years. Um, and then Tesla showed up on the scene. Uh, with the lithium-ion battery. So lithium-ion battery has been around since the 70s, but really um, became a technology we could use um, in mobile applications. It basically be, came to purely down to the safety factor. I don't know if you've ever seen pure lithium exposed to oxygen, but it does explode very rapidly. So um, they had to find a way to make it safe, and that's the lithium-ion battery. Now you have the same weight, around 500 kilograms is in a Tesla, 85 kilowatt hour battery. It goes about 450 kilometers. Um, so, you know, that technology has moved us to the point of competing in range. Now you have a car that gas tank and electric vehicle are both the same. Um, the other thing that happened is that uh, they started to make an uh, electric vehicle look like a vehicle. So I like to call the EV1 the Homer Simpson car. Um, they made it look like an electric car. 
And you know, when you look at how things sort of um, revolutionize, how things become mainstream, um, I like Malcolm Gladwell a lot. He talks about the tipping point. I believe that right now we're in that sort of transition phase of what you might call the tipping point. You know, we're, we're starting to figure this all out. And the other uh, piece of the story is cost. So if you went in right now today, you could go down to Volkswagen and you could buy a Golf in a gas or an electric. Um, the electric is about $15,000 more. Um, the next generation of lithium battery, the lithium metal battery or solid state, um, will have such a high energy density relative to the current battery technology that uh, the cost of the electric vehicle, just in terms of range, will be about the same as an internal combustion engine. So we're talking two to three years from now. And at that point, now you're going to a dealership, and it's, it's about the customer uh, desire. It's not so much about a cost point. So now you can actually go in and pick a car that you want to you purchase, and you're going to do it on your own preferences rather than on your pocketbook. So I really believe that this is the, the sort of way that the technology is moving, and it sort of highlights this destructive technology. I mean, in 1996, lead-acid battery was still the leading technology. Um, and now, 20 years later, we have a completely new technology that's revolutionizing everything. And when you look at what that does for um, you know, the electric vehicle or, or the in car industry market in, in general, the, uh, this is a slide that we use, so it, I'm sorry for the messiness of this, um, but we, this is our marketing slide that we have in our presentation. Um, the orange and red are lithium supply and demand. And you can see an inflection point at about 2025 where the demand for lithium is supposed to skyrocket. And what that's really representing fundamentally is just that that's when they predict that the cost of electric vehicles is going to be the same as the gas-powered vehicle, and everyone's going to start buying them. And then when you look at further into the future 2040, which is the blue lines, the prediction is that that's when you're going to be selling more EVs than electric or internal combustion cars. So this is, this is not, these aren't our stats, these are people who are a lot much smarter than me at economics and prediction of market trends. This is what people are telling us are the trends. And this is what's driving our business, obviously, because we need to be able to sell our commodity into a market. So um, this brings us to today. So um, you know, that analogy is, I think, pretty appropriate for what we're working on. We started the project at the University of Alberta uh, in, in the late 90s, or 2016. The project started uh, in, under NSERC funding in 2017, and so for about two and a half years we've been working with the Alessi lab to develop an ion exchange process to remove lithium from the brine. And I'm not going to talk to you too much about how it works, I was talking to Jonathan, we keep that pretty tight under wraps, and Dan's done a pretty good job. Um, but what it does is it strips the lithium out of the brine pretty effectively. So we get 99% of the lithium out we create a very pure concentrate. So John's talking about the, the, the other elements in the water. Um, it's 200,000 total dissolved solids. So it's very, very dirty. Now, not as dirty as, this, or dirty as the salt sea where you have silica issues, but certainly still needs um, relative to 86 and 200,000. The relative concentrations uh, make it very uh, tricky to get lithium out. And lithium is very tricky to work with to begin with. So, the fact that we can get 99% of the impurities removed, concentrated up to 5,000 milligrams per liter from 86, is really what this technology is all about. So we create this concentrate, and that concentrate now can be put through any lithium extraction processing that's uh, sort of out there in the world. So if you want to make a battery um, lithium carbonate, or you want to make lithium hydroxide, which are the two salts that go into lithium batteries, um, you need to get them 99.5% pure. So if you talk about the Galaxy Note 7 and why they exploded, because they had impure um, cathode material, basically impurities in the lithium that they made the batteries out of that broke the battery down. One of the elements in there is manganese oxide. It gave off two gases, or gave off two elements, manganese and oxygen. Oxygen filled up this little cell phone you had, or Note 7, and, uh, and then eventually the battery degraded and shorted out, and boom. So purity is incredibly important to battery technology. So getting this to the rate we're at is incredibly important. So you know, it's, it's pretty cool because this is, this is an Alberta homegrown solution, really. Um, we like to joke that this is a lithium pump jack. The value of what's coming out of this well uh, today is higher in lithium than it is in oil. The reason for that is the Leduc has been producing oil 
in most regions uh, for you know, 50, 60 years. Leduc number one, which is just south of here in the town of Leduc, uh, hit oil in 1947. First oil well in Alberta started the oil rush. So this reservoir is well understood. Um, we use the same advantages that Jonathan's talked about. We're using uh, you know, infrastructure that's in place, abandoned wells. Um, we haven't had to drill a well to do all the work we've done to understand the reservoir. Um, is the, the Alberta advantage is truly there. Um, you can see the person in the uh, orange and yellow there sampling the well. We haven't drilled well. We've sampled these already producing oil and gas wells that are producing 98% water, and that water is uh, full of lithium. Um, conventional uh, pr uh, lithium production is what's on the left there. That's a Salar in the, in the uh, Atacama, um, and that is tens of kilometers by tens of kilometers. And they basically pump it out of the, they're in a desert, they're pumping groundwater to the surface, they're letting it evaporate, it takes a couple of years, they crystallize out of salt and they process that salt. Um, so for us, we pump it out of a well, it stays in a closed loop system, we put it through potentially a heat exchanger, then through our ion exchange and it goes right back into the well, there's no environmental footprint um, other than that surface infrastructure where you have the well and the processing facility, so very small. Um, very, very uh, minimized land use, that sort of stuff. So it, it has a bit of a green edge to it as well, um, and it looks good because you're also producing a product that's going into what you might call green technology. So, you know, we're becoming very conscious as a society about where everything comes from, and we look at sourcing of our products, and when you look at, you know, environmental footprint, I think that, that this is pretty important. Social license is very important. So a bit about the company. Um, you know, we've spent the past three years, we're, we're, we've only been around since uh, 2016, so we haven't been around that long. Um, I've only got two points on here for what we've accomplished. There is a lot more, I promise you, but um, the two big ones that we highlight, um, we have 6.7 million tons of lithium carbonate uh, equivalent delineated in Alberta. Just to give you some sort of perspective, that's the sixth largest resource in the world. That's just what we have in one piece of our property. The Leduc Reservoir, which is where the lithium is contained, is likely the largest single source of lithium in the world. So what we're talking about is uh, an oil sand size reserve of, uh, potential reserve of lithium in Alberta. What it's missing is the technology that makes it economic. Just like what, that's what oil sands is missing, that's what porphyry copper was missing, it's potential what geothermal is missing. It really needs just a technology. And that's really the theme of, of what I wanted to talk to you about is that you know, disruptive technology, it doesn't, it happens overnight, it really does. The invention happens instantaneously, but the, the advent, the uh, taking advantage of that technology and, and moving into something that becomes mainstream takes for a very long time. And once we get our, our technology commercialized, which is what we're currently doing today, uh, it has applications all over the world. We believe that it can be used to eliminate these evaporation ponds and that we can then start to uh, use it uh, all over the world and license it out to all these other producers and they can produce their lithium in a much more environmentally friendly way. Um, what we're doing going forward is, uh, we've, this is, this is a pretty novel technology, we have a giant resource, we've attracted the attention of some of the big players. So I've got the uh, live uh, symbol up there. Just this week we finalized and announced a, a partnership with Livent, they're formerly FMC Lithium. Um, they're the largest single play lithium producer in the world, about a billion dollar US market cap. Um, and they're partnered with us uh, to work on this here in Alberta to get this solution from what's now sort of come out of the lab um, and uh, we're ad uh, adamantly working to commercialize it into a commercial process. So, you know, scaling risk is always a, a big deal, um, you know, and that's a bit of a double entendre for Jonathan there. So, um, you know, we're, it is the next thing for this company is to move this forward. So, um, we've got a lot of work to do, but we hope by 2023 we're going to be producing 20,000 tons of the stuff, uh, moving that to 50,000 tons uh, within the next five to six years after that. That's going to be somewhere in the largest production of lithium in the world. So Alberta has this huge advantage, and this is what we're trying to get out of it today. So this is a little bit about the company. Um, I wouldn't be, I'd be doing my company a disservice if I didn't have some gratuitous information about us. So, um, I won't go through this too much. We'll open up for questions, but our, our website address is there, so feel free to look us up and give us a call if you have any questions. And we'll open it up, I guess, to anyone here. Questions?
uh, is it possible to have this technology modified so that it could work off the tailings ponds up in uh, Fort McMurray? And a, a secondary question also is with the number of abandoned wells across Alberta, could this type of technology and I guess also for the geothermal kind of a distributed system so that you could actually be either generating uh, electricity or power or also extraction of lithium? Uh, first question, oil sands. Uh, I, I, I worked on the Fort Hills project early in my career. There's no lithium in the oil sands tailings. Um, there's lots of other stuff. There's I'm good friends with the vanadium guys. They're trying to get vanadium out of it. So, um, yeah, oil sands, not directly applicable. There is a reservoir underneath that does have lithium. It's, it's equivalent to the Leduc. So, uh, but yeah, um, and uh, I think that there is, there is an integration story here. Um, you know, you're struggling with a couple things. One is that the temperature of the Leduc, where we are, is in 80 degrees C. So as Jonathan said, like generating power from it is on the very bottom, if not just below the bottom uh, rung of sort of power generation. But we definitely intend to use a heat exchange um, because there is an evaporation process at the end of this. And so you need to get the heat up to just above 100 degrees. So you can do a lot of that when you have 80 degree water coming through. So. But yeah, as this, this can scale small and big, so you can put it behind a lot of abandoned wells. It's not everywhere, so it has to be a well that has uh, Leduc formation water. But yeah, definitely. So Chris, there's a question up top there. I don't recall who the scientist was, but somebody was mentioning that he feels the real future in electric vehicles is hydrogen cell. Um, putting aside your own uh, in... <laughs> Can't think of the word. Uh, but anyways, putting aside that, uh, how do you feel hydrogen cell versus lithium ion in terms of economic and environmental impact? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I worked with a guy, an Australian, he used to say there's horses for courses. Um, in Canada, I think the hydrogen fuel cell makes a lot of sense. Keep in mind that every hydrogen car has a lithium battery in it today. Um, so most hydrogen cars. Um, when you need... Uh, when, when you lack charging infrastructure and you need large ranges, hydrogen combination with lithium ion battery uh, does make a lot of sense because the hydrogen is making power where lithium is just a storage, the lithium battery is just a storage, right? So um, they, they do compete, but they're not exactly competitors, right? Um, I think for short range, if you had a, a, like a 30 or 40 meg, um, kilowatt hour battery and a small hydrogen cell, you could combine the two, even if you had a small gas power generator in your car, um, then you have commuter traffic, commuter el pure electric, and then if you need to go, you know, Calgary to Edmonton, you might have that extra source to go those long ranges. So um, in Europe and in China, pure electric is, is working perfectly. So, and infrastructure is the other problem, and charging times, all those sorts of things. So yeah, I think there's definitely an and solution there um, that, you, that we're seeing today. Yeah. Next question. How much of the processing and economic activity can be kept in Alberta, or should we start begging already for a pipeline to send it to, <laughs> down to the Gulf? We, we joke, uh, hashtag no pipeline required. Um, uh, this was last year, this year maybe not. Um, look, it's, we're gonna make the salt here in Alberta. There's no economic scenario that makes sense that we produce, we ship this, even our concentrate anywhere. So we will make lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide here in Alberta. And you know, my goal personally is to build an industry around this. Um, exactly, we're two Canadians as a whole. We have a very resource-rich country, and it's it's very easy for us to just ship it overseas. And we do this all the time. And we buy it back for ten times the price. So I would love to see that. The, the benefit we have with the lithium battery market and the EV market in general is that it's expanding rapidly. And where there's that sort of expansion, you can always fill in the gaps. So I think there's a huge business for Alberta. We need to realize it. One of the big things is that lithium is going to be a commodity that's going to be scarce as the, as the industry grows, and that's leverage to bring that technology, bring that, the next pieces of the, of the process here. Okay. We have time for two more questions. The next one is from Rashan. That was yep. great. Uh, actually, you kind of segued into my question, because um, in that graph you showed, the supply and demand would have a huge gap. Yeah. And I guess I, I just don't know what's the actual abundance of lithium. Will we reach a point where there'll be no lithium left for the amount of demand that there is? Yeah, I mean, people said, you, people talk about peak oil, you know, yes, theoretically, but I think that um, the, the challenge isn't so much that you can't find lithium, it's, it was made 
as you probably know, it's one of the elements made in the Big Bang. So there's lots of lithium around. Economic concentrations of lithium, well, then you're starting to get lower. Um, you know, I think that the, in the long term, supply demand will equalize out, just like most other commodities. But the short term, the average lifespan from an expert or discovery of a commodity to a product producing mine is 20 years. So, you know, that's where the gap starts to come, is that you don't have, it takes too long to, to find a deposit, go through all the exploration work that we're going through now to get it to a commercial process and then get it into production, spend million, hundreds of millions of dollars building a process facility. So, yeah, I think that the long term it'll probably even out, but the short term that's why it gaps so much. Okay, last question. So in terms of just uh, like sheer economic volume, how do you think these um, lithium brimes in Alberta comp compare to like the pegmatitic spodumene that they're finding in Eastern Canada? Um, I mean, it's a different, it's a completely different process. Um, the benefit we have is that it's already dissolved in a fluid. So um, the technology we've developed is being implemented in, it's not exact form, but similar sort of processes. And, but they have to mine it first, and then they have to ship it. And they, I, I can use Namaska resources as an example. They're the most advanced. Um, they mine it in northern Quebec. They, sh they concentrate the ore, so they have a rock powder ore. It gets shipped down to Montreal, and then they roast it into sulfuric acid, and then they make something that looks like what we have. So, I, you know, the technology is in early stages. Like, we're not commercial yet, and so there's all those sort of disclaimers. But I do believe that if we're successful, there's no way that that will compete with what we can do here economically. Okay. So. Thank you, Excellent. Chris. Join Thank me in thanking much. Chris for a great talk. I think everyone will agree that Rashawn, Talina, Jonathan, and Chris gave us inspiring and energizing talks tonight. I want to thank everybody for coming to Science Talks, and it's just so gratifying, and it should be so gratifying to me, and it should be so gratifying to you to know that those four speakers are part of our Faculty of Science at the University of Alberta. Um, thank you for all of your support of our faculty. It's been a joy to get to know you tonight. I hope you all have a great evening and a great rest of Alumni Weekend. Thank you very much.